the argument that Michael Jordan's career has essentially been perceived as the template to be the GOAT, and if you don't achieve exactly what he did and beyond that, you cannot surpass him, that's just true. Hello everybody, welcome to Awesome Rusty Buckets. If you're over on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to the channel and drop a like. The like helps the video do much better in the algorithm, so it's much appreciated. Also check us out over on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you wanna enjoy this as an audio only experience. We're back with Hot Takes Tuesdays. Unfortunately, we didn't have a Hot Takes Tuesday on Friday, so I'll make sure to make this a good one. From Nana Ya, hot take, the new CBA is too harsh. It fulfills its intended purpose of leveling the playing field and preventing teams from just spending as much as possible to get better, but it had seriously detrimental side effects of making it difficult for teams to run it back with the same core year after year and restricts from making trades too much. It seems like the only championships we will see in the near future are young teams with homegrown players on undervalued contracts. It's not necessarily against, but not being able to pay to keep those players long term seems unintended. I believe what the problem with the CBA is, is it's kind of contradictory to the current landscape of the NBA. Like, you're not really going to be able to afford the market price of more than like six really good confidently in your playoff rotation players but the thing is the talent is so inflated in the nba that most teams are going to have players in that ballpark and most contenders are going to have players in that tier and then beyond it so like the teams that are going to end up not having that like the denver nuggets for example who over the last two years have lost kcp and bruce brown well those players are just going to go to other teams and then it's their turn to have these role players that help them win and i don't know it doesn't really i don't feel like being able to keep bruce brown and kcp was like the reason that dynasties and like uh, fucking super teams were prevailing over the nba i think it just continues to keep good teams in contention while they still remain beatable because it's not like the Nuggets were some unbeatable team. The NBA needs to expand. I think if the NBA expanded, it would help this issue because contract values would be down a little bit just because there's more teams to go to, or maybe that makes it higher. I don't really know. All I know is the fact that the moment that a team wins a championship, it's like, all right, which players do we have to lose here? That kind of sucks, and I don't think the goals of like preventing super teams and whatever is worth tanking the ability to keep a role player on the roster. I really don't think that's necessary, and uh, yeah, it's definitely harsh to a degree that like you are only willing to take the consequences of the second apron if you're like very, very confident you're going to win a championship. like. Whether or not the Nuggets or the, the Timberwolves should have made the Carl Anthony Towns trade, just from a pure talent standpoint, like maybe you could argue swapping Randall for other role players and keeping Dante DiVincenzo, if you turn that into three good rotation players, that's better than Carl Anthony Towns. That's theoretically the case. However, the reason that trade got made is because the front office and the ownership in Minnesota just does not think that that team is going to really legitimately without a doubt compete for the title so they're like we're not going to foot this massive bill if we have to pay massive consequences for it just to not even get a title or maybe not even a deep playoff run out of it from benjamin bremer Players get too much hate from fans over untradeable contracts. For example, Zach Levine is an excellent three-level scorer whose contract is beyond his on-the-court production. That's on the front office for being awful at asset management and giving him the max contract. You are both right and wrong in that I don't think you should hate on players for being overpaid because literally if you were in their shoes, of course you would take more money than you're technically worth. Like. Let's say you're working a job where you make 60 grand a year and then you're offered a raise that gets you to 100 grand a year. And as a result, the company might have to lay somebody off or just the environment will change, whatever. Most people are still gonna take that fucking money, okay? Especially if we're talking in the millions now, 
most people are going to be like, oh, you're offering me $50 million? Well, I don't think I'm actually worth that and that this will hurt this franchise, so I am going to pass. Please give me less millions of dollars. Doesn't make any fucking sense. That would never happen, so don't hate on the player for it. However, don't also interpret the acknowledgement of an untradeable contract as hate. Like, that's an actual legitimate thing that you have to factor into the value of a player when you know that they're going to cost a lot of fucking money. If a player is overpaid, that inherently makes them less valuable to a franchise, just like if a player is underpaid, that inherently makes them more valuable to a franchise. So it's a factor to consider, just don't be a dick about it. That's really all there is to it. From Callum, 1990 Hakeem Statwise is the third greatest prime in NBA history. 4.6 blocks and 24 points per game is insane and he was robbed of MVP and Defensive Player of the Year. Let's look, let's look into this. All right, in 1990, I mean, he was seventh in MVP voting and second in Defensive Player of the Year voting. Not that they always get MVP voting right, but if you were seventh, I have my doubts that you should have won that. Uh, let's see, what were the record? They have 41 and 41. Are you talking about 90, 91? No, you're not. You're definitely not, because that's worse numbers and it's not what you were referencing. So what? His team was 500. I'm not acting like these stats aren't ridiculous because 24 points per game in 1990 points per game. Hakeem is at ninth, so he's the ninth highest volume score in the NBA. I would wager probably one of the more efficient ones. It's not like Hakeem was like overwhelmingly efficient. He was at 54.1%, 54%. So he's about league average efficiency on 24 points per game. 4.6 blocks is ridiculous especially in a more modern era. Um, and then he led the league in rebounds with 14. So yeah, I won't deny 3.9 turnovers isn't very good, but I won't deny that. Yeah, absolutely. Hakeem put up one of the best stat lines ever in this season. However, robbed of MVP. No. Who won defensive player of the year that season? Dennis Rodman for the Pistons. Yeah, this award just goes to players who win more games. Dennis Rodman's Pistons won 59 games and they had the second best defense in the NBA. And Hakeem's Rockets had the best defense in the NBA. Well, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Ironically, oftentimes a bad offense will hurt your defensive player of the year chances because your offense, whether I'm not saying it's Hakeem's, but just like for the team at large, the offense ends up making them not that great and we really only give credit to dominant defenses that are also very good teams i think the last example i can think of where like the the dpoi went to a not high win team in spite of the fact that their offense was garbage was joe kim noah in this 2014 season where the bulls had the second best defense in the nba and the 28th best offense getting 48 wins yeah uh that's just based on the precedent of how the award has historically worked i really don't think you can say that he was robbed of mvp and dpoy so i'm gonna go down on that one from mr crispy fried chicken the 0405 Suns and mike d'antoni have become underappreciated i'm beginning to hate the word underrated yeah that's fair in the evolution of the pace and space era um yes and no i think the reason that they get left out is you really don't get too much credit for changing the sport until you win a championship doing it like up until the warriors hoisted up that 2015 banner or i guess maybe not the banner because that was technically after the off season at the start of the next season but after they won that title the can a jump shooting team win a championship discussion pretty much ended right there but until you actually get to that specific finish line, there will always be naysayers. There will always be doubters who say, hey, the play style here doesn't work. It might get decent offensive numbers during the regular season, but you don't end up winning in the long run in that realm. Um, the main reason that the Suns never won a title is because of defense, not because their offense had any kind of struggles. Uh, maybe if Steve Nash shot the ball a little bit more, that would have helped their offense. But in general, that's another one where it's like, you just gotta win to prove it, and that's how the narrative's gonna go if you don't. 
right? Whether that's wrong or not, that's generally how people lean, as evidenced by uh, a lot of the takes people have had about Chris Paul in these comments recently. From B Free, efficiency is making teams worse. Teams are relying too much on high percentage looks that when they face tighter defenses that force them to get a bucket, they fall short. I do believe there is some truth in what you're saying here. There is, if your offense generates great looks all the time, you kind of have an easy go of it on offense, but then what if you face a defense that can really fuck you up in the postseason and then suddenly you're a little ill prepared a good example of that would be the Timberwolves and the Nuggets last year after the Timberwolves put Rudy Gobert on Aaron Gordon and had him just shoot open corner threes and not worried about it uh that kind of broke Denver's offense that otherwise generates good looks constantly all the time but the fact that they really weren't all that good at shooting threes the fact that they weren't all that good at hitting like mid-range pull-ups or contested shots that ended up hurting them because all they really had to go to was their paint scoring but their paint scoring was not as good as it was in the regular season because of Rudy Gobert so on that front yes you kind of do need to have the reps of dealing with a more challenging defense so you know what you're going to do when you face it and know that you're prepared for it like being able to hit difficult shots isn't something that you want to rely on as a core tenet of your offense but you do want to have it you do want to have that option because you know, it's a make or miss league, and if you can make some shots that other teams can't, well, you might fucking win just based off of a couple of difficult jump shots. But at the same time, you also don't want to be like what I felt like the Clippers were for many years with Kawhi and PG, which was that there actually wasn't much of an offensive scheme, and it was just contested jumper after contested jumper. That was especially the case when they also had Lou Williams. Like, that shit might work well enough in the regular season, but also on the same to flip the same coin if you don't have an ability to consistently generate good looks and you haven't developed that muscle memory and a flow of your offense throughout the regular season well then you're also going to do poorly because your offense doesn't generate good looks enough so like unfortunately the answer isn't like one or the other you need to be able to do both and you should ideally try to put yourself in scenarios whether uh, this just happens organically by playing good teams in the regular season or you just simply try to see what your star players can do when they're asked to take more difficult shots. Whatever that may be, you do need to be prepared for either scenario. Being able to get good looks consistently is very important and definitely more important than being able to hit bad looks. But generally speaking, if you're playing another top team, you're going to consistently get bad shots. So you'd ideally want to be able to make those more than your opponent. Another ins instance of you are both correct and wrong. From Treasy, basketball discourse is really bad and it's largely due to the fan base being immature and frankly unintelligent. If you have a differing opinion, fans will hit you with the tired, you don't know ball response. Uh, there's a little bit of hypocrisy in that exact statement saying that they're immature and intelligent but also that they'll insult you for giving a different opinion it's kind of a similar thing but i get where you're coming from unfortunately probably the most prominent talking heads in the sports world are often and not talking heads as in like media members but rather like the people that you see on twitter uh it's mostly kids it's mostly children or like young young dudes mostly dudes and from that front uh, I don't know if there is a more belligerent, terrible, and obnoxious group of people on the internet than young boys and men from like the age of 14 to 22. Just a horrible demographic of people I can attest because I was 16 to 22 at one point and I sucked. So stands to be true most of the time so that's just unfortunately if you have that demographic there's probably going to be a bunch of dog shit in there luckily i think there is enough content in the world and this is how i feel about just about every genre of any type of content that exists if you want to find smart people who talk sensibly about the sport they exist you can find them they might not be at the forefront of the conversation which is unfortunate but they do they are there and you can choose to block out a lot of that noise from ben mick 
Hot take, the GOAT debate has been and will always be rigged in Michael Jordan's favor. While I personally have him as the GOAT, I think it's unfair how everyone else, particularly LeBron, is measured up exactly against his career. Braun went to 10 straight finals, yeah, but MJ is 6-0. Braun rarely made a poor basketball decision and will make the right play every time in the clutch. Yeah, but MJ has the killer mentality to take the last shot. MJ was allowed to carve out his own legacy and that is what made him the GOAT. While he was, of course, compared to other players, no one ever said he wasn't the GOAT because his careers didn't play out exactly how a Wilt, Russell, or Kareem career did. When making the GOAT debate, we need to examine these players as individuals instead of using Jordan as the measurement. This is actually a really good take that is actually making me reconsider a point that I have in a video about Michael Jordan. The title, it's a main channel video that'll uh, come out someday. Title was along the lines of like the mythology of Michael Jordan. There is a narrative through lineness with Michael Jordan's career that is unmatched. Like, for me, I will always say that Michael Jordan essentially had the perfect career in the level of success he had in the time that he had it, the amount of dominance that he had, and in the narrative and highlight element of it all just being so good. Like, Michael Jordan has one of the best highlight reels ever. Uh, and then there are so many, there are endless Michael Jordan stories. There are so many Michael Jordan stories. Now, I also think that is partially a product of us being removed from Jordan's time. Like, we have not seen Michael Jordan play basketball since 2003, and we haven't watched him play meaningful basketball since 1998. So there is inherently, like, when things become the past, become a part of the past, they get mythologize a little bit we romanticize the past and a lot of it is also the social media age where there is more constant regular criticism i'm sure there were definitely people in mj's time criticizing him for not having a wilt russell or kareem like career but those voices are not at the forefront of the conversation as they are now. But yeah, the, the argument that Michael Jordan's career has essentially been perceived as the template to be the GOAT, and if you don't achieve exactly what he did and beyond that, you cannot surpass him. Yeah, that's just true. That's just, the, that's completely accurate. Um, and we have decided what we value in many ways based on the fact that Jordan did it. Now I'm not acting like six and oh in the finals ain't shit, okay? It is a very significant accomplishment. However, just looking at that as like outright better than going to 10 straight, it's just kind of some black and white thinking. And I think that black and white thinking comes from the fact that Michael set the precedent for what the black and the white even was. So yeah, you're 100% correct. And I would say that's one of the better takes that I've ever seen on this channel. So good on you. From Apologetic Pasta, that's a great name. I think Trey Young will end up occupying a similar place in NBA history as Damian Lillard. Undersized point guard who is a great scorer and playmaker with insane range and a handful of great playoff moments and series, but I think like the Blazers, the Hawks will be unable slash unwilling to build a competitive roster around him and he'll be an icon in Atlanta who never won anything like Lillard. Both guys even made a fluke conference finals. I don't think Trey Young is going to spend as much time in Atlanta as Dame did in Portland. I I, if I had to wager a bet, I don't think Trey will be an Atlanta Hawk in his 30s as Damian Lillard was with the Trailblazers. Maybe he'll spend the same amount of years because also Trey spent less time in college, so maybe that'll factor in here. But I, I, I just don't think that da that Trey has like this borderline fetishistic level of obsession with loyalty to a degree where he just ignores constant non-stop red flags that say hey you should get the fuck out of here maybe i don't think the same i don't think the history will repeat itself in that realm now i would i was gonna say that like look at how many trade rumors there have been for uh trey young recently but honestly 
I think maybe like the last six or seven years of Dame's career in Portland, there were pretty consistent trade rumors around him, especially in the latter half there. That's fair. That's a good, that's a good-ish take. I just don't think he will spend enough time in Atlanta for that to be a one-to-one -one comparison. From Thomas A. Human, thank you for clarifying. I was concerned. Um, prime Steph Curry is comparable to Prime Shaq in the amount of attention he gets from the defense. They can't guard him, but try to limit his touches. I would argue that Steph and Shaq are the two heaviest, like most gravitational players in the history of this sport. And Stephen Curry being a significantly better playmaker, which is pretty natural given that he's a point guard, uh, is able to take advantage of that gravity more often. But like, think of how Nikola Jokic uses his scoring gravity. He is such a level of playmaker that he's so good at that that you almost don't even want to look at him as like someone that you need to bring a bunch of attention to because then he'll punish you for that. Now, in zero way am I criticizing Shaq for A, not being way ahead of his time as a playmaker, but B, also not being Jokic as a playmaker, but the factor of the unstoppability of Jokic with how good he is at making the right reads makes him unguardable. Shaq was also unguardable, but like imagine a world where Shaq's like a six assists per game type of player, like makes good reads, doesn't get flustered by double teams pretty much ever. Like Shaq was a solid enough playmaker, but I also feel like there was more utilization that could have been done with the level of attention that he got. That just wasn't really the principles of basketball at that time, or at least it wasn't as well understood as it is today because Stephen Curry brought the expression of gravity and the attention from the defense and how that factors into the sport more so than it ever has been discussed before. So I honestly think this is just the perimeter version and the paint version of the same concept. Shaq around the basket is such a prolific and terrifying scoring option that defenses inherently have to leave open options available on the perimeter. And for Steph, he is such a world beater from outside that you'll end up leaving, whether it's open jumpers or open layups, available to other players on the floor. I think Steph's gravity ultimately is better and more valuable, and he's the most effective gravitational player ever, given his playmaking ability and given the fact that rather than mostly generating open jump shots, he's generating open everything. But yeah, I think Shaq and Steph, those are the two guys who it's like, yeah, the defense is going to pay them an insane amount of attention and you're going to have to punish them. I would say that Jokic and LeBron are the other two guys who are in any level comparable to them in that department. Michael Jordan a little bit. Um, but yeah, I agree. 100% good take. From Mason Miller, coaching and scheme is more important for spacing than the presence of an actual high percentage three-point shooter. Obviously, both are important, but a good coaching scheme can make good spacing out of okay shooters. I, the way I feel about it is more like you either fuck it up or it's fine, because most NBA offenses know how to space properly at this point. So like, I'm not going to give a coach a bunch of credit just for their scheme resulting in a bunch of spacing because most teams can space properly. So then it does come down to how high quality are your shooters in actuality. There is only so much you can affect as a coach like Aaron Gordon being left open in the corner. Aaron Gordon still standing in the corner. There's nothing the coach can do except tell him to do that still didn't space the floor properly because he was not a high percentage shooter. So I'm going to lean towards no. I don't think it's more important. Should we consider that in the equation of spacing more often? Sure, absolutely. I'm with that. More important though, I just can't agree with you on that. From River Jordan 2010, I didn't understand how difficult calling a game would be until I went to an NBA game live. The speed and intensity in person is just different from that on the TV. You get all the camera angles and replays you want from home. You can't do that during a game. Refs are making split second decisions in a fast pace from a limited angle. If they stopped to make sure that they had every call perfect, the game would take five hours. Yeah, that is just accurate. That's just 100% true. I could not agree with you more. 
I don't even think I want to add anything to it. We were discussing refs in the last hot takes about how I think a lot of people over criticize them. This is the exact reason for that. Like you're sprinting all game, wearing slacks and dress shoes. And which by the way, why? Why is that still a thing? That to me feels like a, a, a equivalent to like the fact that you have to stand if you're a bagger at a grocery store or a cashier. Like what, who are we doing this for? But yeah, you also are limited to your own vision. That's why there's three people on the court. And ideally you would utilize that to its best extent with all three refs looking in different vicinities to cover the majority of the floor. But when you're also running around and making these split second decisions and things are happening fast as hell back and forth you're gonna have lapses where no ref was looking when something happens that's just going to happen there's really nothing you can do about it and if you tried to litigate literally every call that you saw as you say it would take fucking forever like think of what the last two minutes of a close NBA game looked like. That's what the entire game would be like. <laughs> it would essentially turn into like a football level pace of possession where you can get three plays happening in the total of a few minutes. And that's about it. Probably not to the same extreme as football, less CTE involved there. But uh, yeah, it would take long as fuck. They wear tennis shoes now. They definitely wore sports shoes or, or yeah. dress shoes for a while. Okay, I'm glad they changed that. This gotta hurt your feet like a motherfucker. All right, from Cook with Sully, this is going to be the last take of the day. Larry Bird is the greatest all around player of all time. Elite scorer, elite passer, passer, criminally underrated rebounder and defender as he made three all defensive teams and was even top three in DPOY once. Best shooter of all time and he could score from literally Oh, of his time. Thank God. I read that as of all time. I was about to roast the fuck out of you and could score from literally everywhere. Yeah, this is mostly true. Let me look up that third and DPOY thing. DPOY third. Yeah, 1983. I didn't know he was third in DPOY voting one year. That's crazy. Yeah, behind Sidney Moncrief and Tree Raw. Okay, well, it was a four way tie for who got third. So that makes it a little less insane true enough like i didn't even think he would have had a top five top six in his career so that's that's pretty dope because the only other time he even placed in the conversation was 12th the season after that it's worth mentioning that there is a popularity contest element to this all but i do agree larry bird he averaged like three stocks over this stretch of time which is pretty damn good i do wonder how talented of a defender he would be in a more modern context I don't think I would say he's the most all around player simply because LeBron exists and I think was a better defender, better playmaker and better scorer, um, more efficient of a scorer, not as good of a jump shooter overall, but oh man, this will piss people off, but I don't fucking care. LeBron James is also a better three point shooter than Larry Bird. Want to clarify, I mean that as in the volume is high enough and especially the last couple of years of his career his percentage is high enough that i consider that ultimately making you the better three-point shooter because if you're taking double the amount of threes and there's only like a three percent difference you just proved to be a better shooter more frequently obviously there's the argument that larry bird could have shot more threes and would have maintained that percentage but it didn't happen that's not what happened and I'm going based off of what happened and based off of what happened, LeBron has been a far more prolific three-point shooter throughout his career. So he's better at that. Definitely a worse mid-range shooter. There are not percentages from Bird's era, but I think that's a fair thing to assume. And rebounding wise, LeBron is definitely not in the tier of Larry Bird. I think a lot of people forget with Larry Bird that he is a very good, like double digit rebounds for his career, exactly double digit, 10 a game. And this first four seasons in the NBA, he was averaging 11, two and a half of those being offensive boards. That's pretty good. He was a power forward to start his career. I think a lot of people don't seem to know that, but yeah, dude, dude is definitely has a very strong case for being the best one of the best, if not the second best, if not the best in your opinion, in your summation, all around players of all time. But that is it. Uh, hopefully this edit is salvageable. 
I believe it will be. But uh, shout out to Nick for editing this video and goodbye.